Welcome back to another mini episode in our Corona Cabin Fever series of videos. In the last video, which I'll put a link up to in the corner, I explained why I'm doing these. Also in that mini episode, I looked into the mystery of the barbecued Mopar, so if that sort of thing interests you, go ahead and check it out. Now let's talk about something else. A little bit of World War II history in my backyard, which in a roundabout way has something to do with the automotive industry. Out on a dusty gravel road just a few miles from that burnt out Mopar is a small marker crowned with a wooden model of an airplane on its top. That marker reads as follows. On July 31st, 1943, a U.S. Army Air Force B-24 bomber carrying a crew of five crashed at this site during a severe thunderstorm, killing everyone on board. This marker is placed here in their memory. Pilot, First Lieutenant Melvin S. Meeker. Co-pilot, Second Lieutenant Samuel Levitt. Bombardier, Second Lieutenant Matthew J. Radosevich. Engineer, Technical Sergeant James M. Parker. And finally, Radio Man, Technical Sergeant Thomas J. Lyshen. The crew was on a navigation flight from Topeka ARM, Air Force Base, Topeka, Kansas, to Duluth, Minnesota at the time of a crash. And of course, it was placed here by the Iowa Military Aviation Heritage Museum out of Ankeny, Iowa. For those of you unfamiliar with Iowa, that's a suburb of Des Moines, basically. So why am I making an episode on this? Well, there's several reasons. Number one, very few people, even the people in my area, know that this thing is here. Number two, history is pretty interesting. In fact, it's so interesting, they made a whole channel for it. Number three, by bringing more attention to this site, I feel it helps honor the memory of the crew. And lastly, like so many things in the Second World War, these bombers were built in giant auto plants. So let's talk a little bit about the B-24 Liberator in general. It's a pretty interesting plane. It was the most produced heavy bomber of the Second World War, with over 18,000 completed by the end of hostilities. The Lib was also the most advanced heavy bomber in the American arsenal when the United States entered the war, and it remained so until the introduction of the B-29 Superfortress in 1944. Despite this, the Liberator in 2020 is vastly overshadowed by the legacy of the B-17 Flying Fortress in our national memory. One of the reasons for this is simply that during the war, no films were produced starring the Liberator. The Flying Fortress, however, got all the press because William Wyler, a Hollywood director who was working with the War Department, shot a magnificent documentary detailing the crew of a B-17 called The Memphis Bell. Weiler's film put the B-17 front and center as THE heavy bomber for many Americans at the time, despite the fact that it was used in smaller numbers. Even many years later in 1990 when Hollywood was looking to shoot a film on a bomber, the B-17 and the Memphis Bell got the silver screen treatment over the Liberator. Another reason is simple aesthetics. For a lot of people, the B-17 is the prettier plane. The Flying Fortress is much more rounded and in general, people tend to prefer a rounded airplane versus a boxy airplane like the Liberator. The third reason is the B-17 had a reputation as being the more robust bomber of the two. Some of this reputation is warranted though. If hit by anti-aircraft flak or the cannons of enemy airplanes, the B-17 generally had less issues. This was not because it was built to a better standard with better materials, but simply because it's an earlier design. There was much more empty space in the fuselage and wings of a B-17, so a flak or cannon round was less likely to damage critical components. The B-17 also had a reputation as being an easier to fly airplane due to it being less advanced and possessing better low speed handling. 
However, the B-24 as a competing design did have some advantages over the earlier Boeing. It was designed to be efficient and fast. The B-24 utilized a new wing design called the Davis Wing. The Davis Wing was a radical departure from the 1920s era wing design of the Flying Fortress. The Davis Wing was thick, with a much shorter cord and a longer wingspan. This helped to reduce drag at speed, giving the Liberator a significantly faster cruising speed than the B-17, and compared to early models of the Flying Fortress, allowed it to fly a little higher as well. The more efficient wing also helped the B-24 carry a larger bomb load, meaning more ordnance could be dropped on target. The thick wing also allowed for easy mounting of the engines and a higher fuel capacity, meaning that the B-24 could not only fly faster, drop more bombs, but could reach further into enemy territory. As mentioned earlier though, the trade-off for all of this was a wing design that was less forgiving to battle damage. The Liberator was also a much more versatile airplane. Not only was it a solid heavy strategic bomber, but it was well adapted to anti-ship and anti-submarine warfare due to its speed, ordnance payload, and long range. The B-24 proved to be a crucial airplane in winning the fight against Axis shipping and submarines in every theater. The bomber was also a miracle of American industry and mass production. The B-17 had the benefit of being designed over several years during relative peace, and that resulted in a well-executed aircraft. The B-24, however, was designed and put into production in only a fraction of that time because the clouds of war were approaching and America had to rearm. At one point, Ford Motor Company's Willow Run plant churned out one complete B-24 Liberator every 55 minutes and ran 24-7. This feat is even more amazing when you compare the manufacture of a period Ford car to that of the Liberator. The typical Ford of 1940 had around 15,000 parts, counting every single nut and bolt, and weighed in the neighborhood of around 3,000 pounds. The Liberator, on the other hand, required the assembly of 450,000 parts and 360,000 rivets. The finished Liberators also tipped the scales at a massive 18 tons when completed. In just two and a half years of production at Ford's Willow Run Plant, they produced 8,000 645 Liberators versus the 9,808 that were manufactured by four factories run by Consolidated Aircraft, Douglas Aircraft, and North American Aviation. So if you were wondering again how this ties into cars, well there you go. The man that was able to produce one complete car every three minutes at one point with the Model T had adapted those methods to produce 24 heavy bombers every day for the war effort. Okay, that's enough about the Liberator in general. Let's go back and talk about this specific B-24 and the very sad event of its crashing. I wanted to see if I could find more about it. However, because of the current situation with COVID-19, all the local museums, historical societies, and libraries are closed to the public. Navigating the various tubes and switches of the internet, I was able to find an Associated Press blurb in a San Bernardino newspaper from 1943. It appears that the Liberator's starboard wing snapped off in the high winds of the thunderstorm. Digging around on the strengths and weaknesses of the Davis wing, I feel the design's weak points were possibly a contributing factor to the crash. The general design of the wing means that naturally it has about a 35% higher load on its wings compared to a flying fortress. This extra load combined with the high winds and any possible manufacturing or material issues from rushed war production could be the explanation for the failure of the wing. Before I left, I, I wanted to do something for these young men that lost their lives here. After 77 years, I have no idea if they have friends or family left to honor their memory where they're buried. One of the things that I personally fear the most is the idea that once I'm gone, I will be completely forgotten. And since I have no clue if these five souls have anyone left on this planet to honor their memory, I decided I should leave something here. So hopefully this simple cross of red, white, and blue flowers, along with a miniature version of the Stars and Stripes, will let them know, wherever they are, that someone is still thinking of them 
honoring their memory and their sacrifice to this country. Thank you so much for watching this video. Normally at this point I would do the whole, hey, if you enjoy this content, hit the thumbs up, subscribe, share with your friends thing, but after standing at this location, there's no way I'm going to ask you to do that. I have a couple dozen other videos that can push this channel forward. If this episode does anything, I hope it motivates you this coming Memorial Day to maybe taking a couple miniature flags and some extra flowers out to a graveyard and honoring the memory of somebody you think might be forgotten. So this is Bobby D signing off, and as always, wherever you are on this big blue planet, I hope you're kicking butt, I hope you're taking names, but more importantly, in these uncertain times, I hope you're killing with kindness. We'll see you in the next video.